Its exploits are legendary. Its battlefield, the skies over Korea. For over two years, this famed jet fighter took on its Russian counterpart, the powerful MiG-15, and cut its way through the communist ranks that threatened the air supremacy of the United States, the F-86 Sabre. In one-to-one -one dogfights, the Sabre created a new breed of American fighter aces. You need the will to fight. That's what you supposedly have trained for all your career. In its dual roles as interceptor or fighter bomber, the Sabre was a battle. Nobody is prouder of what they flew than an F-86 Sabre pilot is of what he flew. It was the cream of the crop for a young fighter pilot in the early 50s. Using archive film and color reenactments, Battle Stations retraces the remarkable story of America's first swept-wing fighter and enters the world of the elite battle-hardened air crews of the F-86 Sabre Jet. By the end of World War II, the Allies were flying a series of classic fighter aircraft. The P-51 Mustang, with its high speed and long range, escorted the heavy bombers right over the heart of Hitler's Reich. The F-4U Corsair was a brilliant fighter bomber which the Japanese nicknamed Whistling Death. And the legendary Spitfire had helped the RAF win the Battle of Britain. The pilots who flew these fighters were the elite of the elite. But all these planes were propeller driven. A new technology would soon dominate the skies, the jet engine. Only one nation, Germany, had deployed a jet fighter in actual combat by the end of the war, the super-fast Messerschmitt 262. In the years after the war, the race was on for the victors to develop jet fighters. The company that had designed and built the piston-engined Mustang, North American Aviation, was at the forefront of jet fighter development. The president of the company was Dutch Kindleberger, a very capable engineer and also had uh, an understanding of general management and had an influence over the designer that he not only built an airplane that could perform, but you also had to design it so that you could pr produce it. James Dutch Kindleberger's design team, led by John Lee Atwood, one of the designers of the Mustang, had access to the data captured from the Germans at the end of the war. The Germans had experimented with a variety of aircraft designs before coming up with the swept wing of the ME-262. And it had an advantage in its speed and flying capability. And this information then was transferred back to the U.S. and our technical people studied this information and discovered that a 35 degree sweep would have a tremendous advantage on speed and the maneuverability. By August 1947, North American's design team had produced a prototype jet fighter designated the XF-86. The first flight was made by George Welsh, North American's leading test pilot. Although the takeoff was a success, Welsh encountered serious problems in mid-air. He couldn't get the plane's nose gear down on the return. It looked as if the first flight of the XF-86 would end in disaster. Another test pilot, Bob Hoover, was flying the chase plane alongside Welsh. Hoover saw the danger and radioed Welsh to try and land on the two back wheels. The airplane's been landed without the nose gear a lot of times and it's no big problem for you, and I'll be right with you, and if you need any help, I'll be touching down with you and stopping with you, and I think it's the right thing for you to do. Otherwise, you're going to cost the company an awful lot of time and money to belly it in. With the plane approaching the airfield fast and the nose gear refusing to come down, Hoover again tried to persuade Welsh not to belly land the jet. As we came in on the approach, I asked him the last time he still had his gear up. I said, George, please put the gear down. I see no danger for you. 
And as he slowed down, I said, now dump your flaps, which would help you to get them to keep the nose up. And he, and he dumped the flaps, and I said, hold it off, hold it off. And as he slowed down, the air loads came off, and the gear came out and locked. Having survived its first test flight, the XF-86 was put through air trials lasting several months. The aircraft first flew supersonic in April 1948, setting a new world airspeed record of 670 miles per hour. Now officially designated the F-86, the jet fighter first entered service with the U.S. Air Force in the spring of 1949. It was also given the name that would become a legend of the skies, the Sabre. The Sabre was a triumph of design. Its main features were a 35-degree swept wing and an oval fuselage. Air entered through a nose intake for the jet engine that was in the rear half of the plane. Everybody in that era wanted to fly the Sabre. You never knew whether you were going to get to because you didn't make those decisions when you were an aviation cadet or a young second lieutenant. When the Sabre F-86 came along, I mean, it was just the epitome of, of a beautiful airplane that, that uh, handled just so well, especially uh, in and out of the, the traffic pattern. And of course, it did a very good job. The F-86 was a fine looking bird. It, it, it looked like it was going fast. When you got into it and, and started flying it, the aircraft itself just handled beautifully. It was sort of like a sports car compared to the rest of it. For these future top guns, the Sabre seemed to be invincible. But the Sabre would soon have its baptism of fire as its pilots found themselves in a life and death struggle with a deadly adversary in the skies high over Asia. The peace at the end of World War II was soon followed by a period of tension between the two superpowers, the Cold War. With Japan's defeat in 1945, the Americans and the Soviets jointly occupied the former Japanese colony of Korea. Using the 38th parallel as the dividing line, the communists occupied the north and the Americans the south. But after several years of division, the north tried to unify the country by force, and in June 1950, North Korea suddenly attacked South Korea. President Truman immediately pledged the United States to lead a United Nations force to defend South Korea. By November 1950, UN troops had forced the communists right back across North Korea as far as the Chinese border, along the Yalu River. But to the amazement of the West, the Chinese now entered the war. Hundreds of thousands of Chinese volunteers came pouring down out of the mountains and threw the UN troops back in a major rout. Until the Chinese invasion, the Allies had total mastery of the air. American B-29 bombers ranged freely over North Korea, bombing enemy targets without fear of attack. Now, flying out of bases inside China, a new jet suddenly appeared in the skies. It was a super-fast machine, the MiG-15. Allied bombers who once flew unchallenged suddenly found themselves easy targets. None of the Allied planes could compete with the Russian-built MiG. Losses mounted. The MiG was really designed to shoot down B-29s, or big bombers. It was armed with one 37mm cannon uh, on the right side under the intake, and on the other side there were two 23mm cannons. If those big balls of fire started going by you, it was boom, 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 about that fast and uh, you'll never forget them. 
The US Air Force was stunned. They desperately needed something to match the speed and firepower of the MiG-15. Air power was clearly the major advantage that uh, the Allied forces had, had enjoyed at this point. So the MiG-15 was a huge threat to that. Its impact was enormous, and it forced the United States to deploy F-86 units, which might well not have been deployed. It would take several months to get the Sabre squadrons operational for Korea. But U.S. command decided to rush out an advance party of Sabres immediately. 26 F-86s from the 4th Fighter Interceptor Wing flew from their base in Delaware to the west coast. Here the aircraft were wrapped and loaded onto the decks of tankers bound for Japan, where they would then be flown onward to Korea. However, on arriving in Japan, their commander, Lieutenant Colonel Bruce Hinton, found that his urgently needed jets had been damaged. The cover didn't seal all the way, and so salt water was allowed to get to some of those airplane parts. The amazing thing to me was the corrosion was so vast. Out of the initial load, we managed to get seven airplanes that were in good enough condition so that they could be taken to Korea. It was a disastrous setback. Only a tiny number of serviceable jets were ready for action. Within days, a patrol of four Sabres was in the air over Korea when they encountered their first MiGs. We spotted these four airplanes coming toward us at a very impressive high rate of speed. It was unbelievable how fast they seemed to be going compared to all other airplanes we'd been seeing up to then. The astonished pilots took evasive action against the equally surprised MiGs. The lead Sabre rolled his jet to come up behind the MiG leader and fired. I used almost my entire load of ammunition on him before he finally looked like he was out of control and went on into the ground. Bruce Hinton, seen here getting out of his plane, took the accolade of being the first Sabre pilot to shoot down a MiG-15. But he was under no illusion about its capabilities. My first impression then of the MiG was that I was up against something that was really a dynamo of an airplane. This tiny advance party of Sabres had been lucky, but would Bruce Hinton's triumph be a foretaste of what was to come? On the ground, the UN forces checked the Chinese advance. They retook Seoul, the South Korean capital, in a bloody battle and a new front line was established just north of the 38th parallel. The majority of the Sabres arrived in Korea in early 1951. I almost cried when World War II ended because I was 16 and was afraid I wouldn't get to fly combat. And I was just frothing at the mouth to get into, into the war. I got my choice out of flight school of, of assignments, and uh, I volunteered for F-86s in Korea. When I came along as a young second lieutenant, I felt there was nothing really that I wanted to be a part of more than the Korean War. That was the action. That was where the, uh, the potential for what all we had been working for and how we were given the opportunity to, to participate in it. For many of the young air crew, who had never left their hometowns before, Korea was another world. It was extremely cold. From Alabama, I had never felt cold like that. But the stench was just awful. And everywhere you looked, uh, there were destroyed buildings. So the war was immediately uh, visible to you. And, and the stench of sewage was everywhere. Two fighter interceptor wings of Sabres were eventually assigned to Korea. The 4th, headquartered at Kimpo, and the 51st at Suwon. Each wing had three Sabre squadrons. It took more than 200 men to maintain and fly a squadron of 25 Sabre jets. An operational tour of duty in Korea was 12 months, or 100 missions for pilots. The men spent their tour mostly working and living on the base. 
our quarters were up on a hill that overlooked Kempo Air Base, K-14. And uh, it was an old Japanese fighter base, and we lived in Japanese barracks. We had a common latrine for the area, and then we, the officers' club, it actually it was the officers' open mess. It was called Swig Alley. We had movies every night. The uh, movie screen was on a downhill slope overlooking Kempo Air Base, and at night we'd watch movies and watch the uh, artillery going off on the front lines. That's how close we were. The arrival of the F-86 Sabre had given the Air Force a formidable weapon against the MiG. Although outnumbered, America's first swept-wing fighter was about to enter a life-or-death struggle in history's first jet versus jet air war. Spring 1951. In the skies over Korea, American and Chinese fighters, equipped with the most powerful aircraft to date, were about to engage in the first full-scale jet versus jet combat in history. The sheer speeds of the jets in air combat were incredible. Two jets approaching head-on could be closing at over 1,200 miles per hour. Dogfights could be over in a split second. With the speed you're flying, it doesn't take much of a split-second mistake in judgment to throw your aircraft in three counties away from uh, where, you, where you really want it to be. Many of the pilots who flew in Korea were themselves experienced piston engine flyers from World War II. They had to adapt quickly to the differences in jet fighter combat. What it really did was to enlarge on the area that you covered when you were in combat. In other words, circling, attacking, dog fighting, and that sort of thing, at higher speeds required a lot more altitude and a lot more geography. And so that was the major difference. The Sabres were kept in bays protected by sandbags. Each aircraft was assigned a ground crew. The crew chief was a highly trained mechanic dedicated to ensuring the aircraft was combat ready at all times. I would uh, visually look at the aircraft and make sure that the wings were clean, that tires were inflated, the electrical system was all running and operating, and the instrumentation also was running. I would check the aircraft thoroughly, and if it needed any repair, I would either make it or have it done by a specialist. The bitterly cold winters were another problem for ground crews. The simple task of starting a jet engine was a major undertaking. That extreme cold weather makes metal contract, and of course your aircraft is all metal. So it made it kind of hard for taking parts off and then putting parts back on. We had to learn to work with gloves because we didn't dare touch bare metal with gloves or we would lose skin off our fingers. And that actually happened to a couple of fellas that didn't take the precaution. A major problem with flying jet fighters was the intense pull of gravity, known as the G-force. The faster the acceleration, especially when the plane pulled out of a dive, the more serious the consequences for pilots. As you pull G's, the force of gravity forces blood away from your brain. Eventually you'll black out and go completely unconscious. To combat this problem, the Air Force introduced a G-suit, which was a nylon girdle holding a set of rubber bladders across the abdomen and legs. These bladders would fill up. The more G's you pulled, the more air would be pumped into these bladders, and uh, as a result, it would squeeze your lower extremities to the point whereby it would prevent the blood from coming down here and your legs swelling up. In addition to the flying equipment, a pilot carried his 45 automatic, a May West, and a parachute. When we flew with those things on, with all this equipment inside, the first thing you noticed was when you got in the cockpit and you had to be assisted in, the crew chief, before you uh, taxied out, had to reach across you and push the gunfire circuit breaker. You couldn't do it because you were too bundled up. So it was up to the crew chief to make sure your guns would fire when you got off the ground. Pilots liked the Sabre's cockpit. Its design was simple and efficient. 
the layout was good. The switches and the gauges were where you wanted them to be. And it was very easy to pick up rapidly where each one was and where the differences were. You had a fairly roomy cockpit, and you uh, were able to turn around, and if, if you stretched and twisted, you could look directly behind you. The F-86 Sabre was armed with six 50 caliber Browning M3 machine guns. When you fire those guns, you have approximately 1,500 rounds per gun. That's enough to make it fire about 45 seconds continuously, but you don't do it that way because then you're out of ammo. So you usually fired in short bursts. But when you did, that's the loudest sound you're ever going to hear because six of those things on all, on all sides of you is one loud noise. Yet despite its high rate of fire, the Sabre was outgunned by the MiG's cannons. We could hit the MiG a number of times and the MiG wouldn't necessarily go down. But if the MiG hit an F-86 uh, a few times with those cannons, the F-86 was not going to make it home. The MiGs were also better able to climb when fighting at lower altitude. The MiG had things that we would have liked to have. It could get higher than we could. That's a big advantage because if you can come down on somebody, your chances of getting them are much better. They could get above us and we couldn't touch them. The one big advantage the Sabre did have over the MiG was a better gun sight. The Sabre was able to lock onto and track a target, which improved its kill rate. Okay, I want to take that one on the outside there. I keep the cover now. Go on in. It was a very satisfying job to see the plane come back and that everything was all right. The bonus was when we came back and we see that they would have a burnt nose, and that meant that uh, the guns had been fired in combat. And, of course, if our pilot happened to get uh, made, well, then we felt we took credit for it because that's, that was our plane. We fixed it. Each morning, the pilots were briefed on the day's missions, which could be close support for bombers or routine combat patrols. The Sabres would take off at three-second intervals and cruise at about 40,000 feet, constantly on the lookout for MiGs. Tactics were similar to those used by the German Luftwaffe in World War II. Most of our formations were flown in what we called a fingertip formation, and that's because your fingers are the same positions relative as the planes in that four-shipper. This would be the leader out in front. This would be his wingman, the number two man. This would be the element leader, number three, and four would be his wingman. But the essential combat unit was a pair, a leader who was covered and protected by his wingman. You have to almost be two-headed. Uh, you have to watch your leader and you have to maneuver with him, but your sole job is to keep him clear because when he's shooting, he can only concentrate on the gun sight and the enemy aircraft up ahead. Wingmen learn to fly backwards in the seat and, and still stay in formation. It was just terrible to say, lead, I've lost you, on the radio. I mean, that was just the worst thing you could possibly say. But in spite of the deployment of 150 Sabres to Korea, it remained outnumbered by the MiGs. When the two jets met in face-to-face -face combat, the encounter often came down to the skills and courage of the individual pilots. Armed with the most lethal fighter in the Air Force, American Sabre pilots were about to take on MiG pilots in some of the fiercest dogfights ever seen. Initially, the Korean War was a bitter struggle for survival. But after six months of brutal combat, it settled into a war to contain communist expansion in Asia. Many in the U.S. military regarded Korea as a war fought with their hands tied behind their backs. They believed they were not allowed by the rules of engagement to take the action that would bring total victory. The air war was mostly fought over North Korea. The MiGs were flown out of bases like Antung, across the border in China. The area in which they patrolled, preying on U.S. bombers, was known as MiG Alley. It was here that most of the dogfights took place.
However, the rules of engagement laid down by the United Nations prohibited Allied aircraft from crossing the Yalu River and flying over Chinese airspace for fear of escalating the war into a bigger conflict. It was the most frustrating time I spent over there. With MiGs descending all around me, ignoring me, but descending into Antung, and I couldn't shoot at him. Our enemy was flying out of a sanctuary that we couldn't get to, and so they could retire any time they wanted to. But uh, we found ways to overcome that, and although we don't talk about that much, I don't think it's been publicized much. We crossed the Yellow River periodically and went over where they were, and, and they knew it, and uh, they knew we were doing it. Flying the long distance to MiG Alley meant Sabres only had about 20 minutes combat time before having to make the return journey to home base. We had to go 200 miles into enemy territory to get to them. It was usually up on the Yalu River. That made our job tougher because we couldn't stay there long. They were fighting above their own airfields a lot of the time. If they got hit and had to bail out, why, they were up again the next day. If we got hit and didn't get killed, we were a prisoner. We knew that the North Koreans were killing our prisoners of war, and 66% of ours and the United Nations POWs never made it home. So we knew that it was a big, big danger. The primary role of the F-86 interceptors was to locate and destroy MiGs, but not to attack ground targets. But occasionally this rule was broken. On May the 13th, 1952, Colonel Bud Mahurin was returning from a mission a hundred miles north of the front line. I looked down on the ground and there was a truck going down a road. And I thought, well, I'll just go knock that truck off and go home and I'll have this keen story to all the guys at the bar when I get back home. As Mahurin's saber positioned itself to attack, it was hit by North Korean ground fire and badly damaged. Unable to gain altitude, the crippled Sabre could not get away from more ground fire. I got hit about four more times, and at the end of that, I had fire warning lights. These are crucial, by the way. This is when it's just about ready to blow up, and I knew that I was not high enough to bail out, so I had to fly it into the ground. And uh, I rolled over a couple of times, and when it all came to a stop, managed to drop out into the mud and uh, I broke my arm while that was going on. Although Colonel Bud Mahurin survived the crash, he became a prisoner of war. Over the next 16 months, he was subjected to both physical and mental torture. Out of the 7,200 American POWs held by the communists, 2,700 never returned home. Although the Soviet Union was officially not part of the conflict in Korea, Russian pilots were actually flying MiG sorties and training Chinese pilots. But again, to avoid the risk of escalating the conflict into a catastrophic nuclear war, the UN never admitted in public that it knew Russian pilots were engaged in air-to-air -air combat. A certain secrecy had to be maintained. Because of that, we were supposed to always communicate in Chinese in the air. There were certain restrictions for us. We were not allowed to fly over the sea because one could be shot down, and we had to avoid at all costs being taken prisoner. Sabre pilots soon began to recognize the Russian-flown MiGs. As I looked around, just as he was getting ready to break off the attack, why, he was probably only 30, 40 feet away, and he had uh, just carrot red eyebrows. And I thought, that's very strange for an Oriental. The communists formed training flights of up to 200 MiGs. Chinese and North Korean pilots were usually less well-trained than the Americans, and less eager for action. The MiGs frequently used to come down through us like on an express elevator. We used to dive straight through and, and keep going. 
other times uh, they would stand there and slug it out with you for a few minutes before they took off. Whoever blinks first is going to lose. <laughs> Aerial combat is a very impersonal thing. You know that there's another individual there, but it's more of an airplane and its performance, and I, I'm not being cold about it, but, uh, but it was uh, a challenge of airplane versus airplane and not that much concern about the, uh, the, the people involved. The MiGs outnumbered Sabres by five to one. Ambitious American pilots knew that they could quickly make their reputation by shooting them down. A new breed of ace soon appeared in Korea. Pilots who proved themselves to be determined and ruthless hunters. Making ace, the term, was developed by the French in World War I. And uh, if a pilot got five aerial victories, then he was declared an ace. And it became every fighter pilot's dream to get five kills. Uh, and that was certainly my dream. It was just fighter versus fighter, which is the greatest sport there is. You need the will to fight. And that's what you supposedly have trained for all your career. And now that the time has come, uh, you're supposed to put up. My all-time favorite ace of aces was Ralph Parr, because he, he would tackle eight MiGs all by himself and just go round and round and round with them. Ralph Parr was tested to the limit during an encounter with a Russian ace. This film was taken by the gun camera in his saber. I took him off my squadron commander's tail and let him know that I was there by shooting in front of him just to get his attention. And uh, we went into a dogfight that lasted for six minutes before I pulled the trigger again. Six, six minutes of violent maneuvering and anything I could do, he could do just as well. And I had the gun sight almost on him, but it wasn't there and I didn't fire. You don't shoot until the picture is right. Pa fired a burst at the MiG, but it was too far away. The first time I shot at him, I was pulling nine and a half G's and my gun sight fuse blew. And uh, from that time on, you, it, it behooves you to get closer so you don't miss. I nailed him from somewhere in the vicinity of about 20 to 30 feet. Ralph Parr shot down 10 MiGs, making double ace in just seven weeks. He was a real professional and he retired as the most decorated fighter pilot in the Air Force. Some Sabre aces had an arrogant, devil-may-care attitude. On one occasion, Captain Joe McConnell was in hot pursuit of two MiGs across the Yalu River when he ran into a whole pack. Dean Abbott was McConnell's wingman. I called MiGs coming in from 4 o'clock, Roger. MiGs caught coming in from nine o'clock roger i kept calling out flights of migs until finally i said my god joe there must be 30 of them his response for which he got justifiably famous was yeah and we've got them all to ourselves <laughs> with abbott protecting his wing mcconnell shot down his 14th mig of the war then as the sabers circled behind another four migs a fifth pounced on abbott Immediately, McConnell maneuvered into position to attack. He did a half roll around the guy who continued to shoot at me when he should have switched to McConnell, who was slightly behind, and nailed him. That was number 15, and uh, that made him the first triple ace in the war and one of only two. Joe McConnell went on to shoot down a 16th MiG to become the highest scoring ace of the Korean War. In the span of just two years, the F-86 Sabre had proved itself as an interceptor and more than a match for the MiG. But as the demands of the war continued with no end in sight, it was now about to take on a new role as a deadly fighter bomber. From the first day of the Korean War, the ability of the ground forces to call in fighter bombers for support had been crucial. 
The Air Force had been using F-80 and F-84 jets for low-level ground support, but the speed and maneuverability of the Sabre also made it ideal as a fighter-bomber. It was a tremendous fighter-bomber. The real advantage we had with the 86 was that we could go anywhere we wanted, drop the bombs, and we could engage the banks and be fully capable of handling both roles. In April 1953, the 8th and the 18th fighter-bomber groups were armed with the new Mark F Sabres. An improved engine meant the Sabre could now rival the MiG's rate of climb up to 52,000 feet. Air crews were now trained in low-level flying. Some pilots even transferred from the interceptor wings to join the new fighter-bomber groups. The interceptor guys, if they get MiGs, get the glory. But the real fun in flying that airplane was to hit targets on the ground. And it was a good airplane for that role, too. Meanwhile, in California, Bob Hoover, North American Aviation's celebrated test pilot, had been testing a new bombing technique with the F-86F when he was contacted by the Air Force. The general said, I understand you, you're doing some very successful bombing with the airplane. And I said, yes, I think we've got a technique that I can drop 10 or 15 bombs right on the target any time you wish me to. So he watched me just pick them off one of them after the other right into the target. And he said, get your bags packed. He said, you're going out to Korea right now. Hoover was assigned to the 18th Fighter Bomber Group to take part in a special mission to test his new bombing technique. I was cleared for top secret, and the colonel who was conducting the mission, the leader of it, he said, we've got a civilian going with us today, and if he has any kind of a malfunction and has to get out of that airplane, it's our responsibility to make sure he doesn't hit the ground alive. The target was a vital North Korean bridge, which had miraculously survived previous bombing raids. As the flight approached the bridge, Hoover was eager to demonstrate his new technique, but the group leader was in line to bomb the target first. I was the number two person in this 16-bird flight, and I released my bomb and pulled up, and someone behind me said, Hey, boss, you got a direct hit, meaning the colonel had gotten a direct hit and the bridge was gone. And I, I just knew I had knocked it out, and so the center formation pulls up together. Now, this is good luck. The leader had a malfunction, and he still had his bombs. Now, you know, that way we would ever believe that that technique really worked had that not been so lucky for me. During the spring of 1953, communist forces began to plan a series of major assaults, which they hoped would strengthen their position at the truce talks, taking place with the United Nations in Panmunjom. In a series of raids, the Sabres exploited their speed and accuracy to smash munitions trains and arms dumps, helping to prevent an all-out communist offensive. We could commence or dive at 30,000 feet. In about 20,000 feet, you could identify your target, and you go all the way in, and you drop your bombs, the bomb goes off before they hear the noise of the aircraft. Returning from a low-level raid over enemy territory, D. Harper, a pilot with the 18th Wing and World War II veteran, suddenly felt the thud of flak hitting his saber. Within seconds, the compressor exploded and the engine seized. Harper hoped to glide the stricken plane towards the sea and sent a mayday to the rest of the flight. Harry Evans called me and said, I was on fire. D., you better get out of that airplane. He said, you look like a Roman cattle. About that time, nobody had to tell me any longer. But the second explosion took place through the bottom of the airplane, way far the way. I could now see the fire roots and smoke coming into the cockpit. Harper bailed out at low altitude and managed to pull the ripcord before hitting the ground. Despite breaking several ribs and causing a contusion of the spine, he managed to crawl behind a rock. If you've never been missing an action, you never know the feeling or the full understanding of the word lonely. When you've lost your, your machine, you find yourself hundreds of miles from home in enemy territory, 
people willing to kill you, and you've never been there before, well, there is a loneliness there and a depth of desperation that few people ever understand. Harper could hear a rescue helicopter in the distance. He breathed a sigh of relief until he saw two Chinese soldiers coming towards him. I knew I couldn't win the war with a 45 pistol against the Chinese army, but I knew within the immediate area there was a helicopter. And I figured if I could control that area for 10 minutes with a Mi-45 and get them in there, that would save me a long, long stay up at prison camps up in North Korea. So I made the gamble and I shot the two Chinese. Harper was rescued a few minutes later. He recovered from his injuries to continue his flying career in the Air Force. In June 1953, the talks at Panmunjom finally led to the signing of a ceasefire. To the soldiers and airmen in Korea, it was a relief. The war had cost dearly. 54,000 Americans had lost their lives. Chinese losses ran into hundreds of thousands and the Koreans lost more than a million people. In the air war, the Air Force claimed to have shot down 792 MiGs for the loss of 78 Sabres, an extraordinary 10 to 1 ratio that's always been challenged by the Russians. The very speed of the air-to-air -air battle made it very difficult to calculate exactly who had shot down an aircraft. My guess is, is that the ratio may well turn out to be 8 to 1 which is really quite a, an astonishing ratio. The superior training, attitude and determination of the Sabre pilots had made all the difference against the communists. I just felt I was very privileged to be able to work on our aircraft. I have a sense of pride of being with the very best I thought the Air Force could produce, both in airplanes and men. The Sabre was a remarkably forgiving airplane. Uh, you didn't even have to necessarily be a very good pilot to fly it because it was uh, good to you. It was uh, hard to make a mistake in it that would kill you. It became part of me. We were one piece. So that I wasn't lowering a wing. The whole thing was a maneuver. It was just the way it felt. It was a beautiful airplane. For two years, the F-86 faced a lethal enemy in the skies over Korea, where it outperformed the MiG and held the line. It became one of the great fighter jets of the 1950s and 60s. For many pilots, the Sabre has remained the ultimate jet fighter. I've had the privilege of flying most of our current airplanes, all the way back to the first jets. And I can tell you that of all of those airplanes, I felt more comfortable more at home in the F-86 Sabre jet than any of the rest of the airplanes. I have about 5,000 hours of fighter time, so I got to know quite